Okay, well this next speaker, um, although he has sold his soul on eBay, really is one of the friendliest people I know. He, he blogs at The Friendly Atheist. Everyone give a warm Sunday morning welcome to Hemant Mehta. All right, how is everyone doing post-prom? <laughs> I've seen this look before from people coming back from prom. It's never, but I, at least I don't have to teach you math, so it's better. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for having me at Skepticon again. Thank you all for being here. Um, what I want to talk to you about is why skeptics are so gullible, because we usually pride ourselves on being I wouldn't say smarter per se, but we pride ourselves on being able to detect bullshit pretty better than the rest of the general public, right? So it's a problem if we fall for it and it happens a lot. And that's what I wanna talk about. Like, why do we fall for this stuff? And then even when we fall for it, how do we fix that and how do we make it better, right? So there is this guy, uh, his name is Mike Daisy. How many of you listen to this great podcast, This American Life? Awesome podcast. Which, by the way, if any of you want to stop me afterwards and talk about Serial and whether Adnan did, I will totally chat with you about this. But uh, a couple years ago, Mike Daisy, uh, d he's a storyteller, he's a monologuist. He did this really amazing story about how he is an Apple fanboy, loves everything they make, and he didn't just want to have an iPad or have a MacBook, he wanted to know how it was made. And long story short, he ended up traveling to China to go see the factories where it was made. And the story he tells about what he found when he got to China is like, you feel bad for owning anything Apple, right? It's like, I was outside the factory and I saw these children walking you know, out of the factory and they were 14 years old and 13 and 12. And I got in because I happened to, I get to know one of the workers and they are not allowed to form unions. And I got to go to like basically the Chinese version of a Starbucks and we, where we, they met in secret to discuss how they were gonna fix these problems. He goes on for a while. It is such a thrilling, amazing story that he tells. And This American Life devoted the entire episode to that story. And it became their most popular episode at the time of all time. But here's the problem. A few weeks later, an actual business reporter was like, you know, I don't think that's right, because I've covered Apple for many years, and yeah, there are problems at the factories, but the things he mentioned aren't actually true. I don't think they are. But they were like, how am I gonna, fig how am I gonna prove that he's wrong on this stuff? And he's like, well, Mike Daisy went to China with the translator. I how do you find that translator? And basically, he went to Google and typed in a translator in the city that he was in, first name that popped up was the person. So he called her up, he's like, hey, did this guy Mike uh, you know, use your services? She's like, yeah. And he's like, did you find the following things? Like, did you meet these kids walking out of the factory? And she's like, no. <laughs> and basically they broke the story that he exaggerated quite a bit of that tale. And that's a big deal because the way it was presented to the listening audience was as if this were a true story and he wasn't making it up. And you figure, you know, it, it, This American Life tells stories, but they're, they're also journalistic. So if there were exaggerations, shouldn't we have been told that? So here's what I love about that show. Not only did they admit a few weeks later that we were wrong, we should have told you there were exaggerations, we didn't know it because we thought it was all true, they decided to do a follow-up episode. And what they did is they said, here's how the mistake happened. They interviewed that business reporter and basically asked him how he knew all this stuff, how he figured out what was true and what was not. And then the best of all, they brought in Mike Daisy again to interview him, basically asking him, you know, why did you, why did you not tell us this stuff was exaggerations? And you know, at, for a long time, he was just, when they ask him these questions, he's just silent. And they didn't edit any of that out, <laughs> which was awesome because they're like, Mike, why'd you lie to us? awkward silence for like 20 seconds <laughs> and they just play the silence until he gives some semblance of an answer which is that I tell stories and sometimes you exaggerate for dramatic effect and that's what I was doing they're like you didn't tell us you were doing that but anyway well, here's what's amazing that apology episode became their new most downloaded episode of all time and it really did save their credibility because it was a good story that they told to begin with 
But the fact that they could fess up, such like the number one podcast says, we made a mistake, we're going to try to make it better, so here's that episode. And here's what we're doing in the future to make sure it, we can try to not make it happen again. People, people wanted to reward them for that, you know? They kept listening. They didn't, their audience didn't back off. And isn't that what all of us should be doing? One, trying to figure out what's true and not true. And two, if we make a mistake, try to figure out why that happened and ex admit we made a mistake, which is a really hard thing to do. Um, here's a small version of what I'm talking about. A while back, Sam Harris uh, and Ayan Hirsi Ali had a conversation on stage at some conference somewhere. And later on, uh, Sam Harris wrote this on his website. A few weeks ago, Ayan and I had a long conversation um, about her critics and about the increasingly pernicious meme of Islamophobia, which our inimitable friend Christopher Hitchens once dubbed a word created by fascists and used by cowards to manipulate morons. Damn, I miss that guy. <laughs> but here's the problem with that. Turns out, Hitchens never said that. In fact, it was a dude on Twitter who said that. And he tagged Sam Harris in it, which may be how he picked it up or something. But, it rec but here's what Sam Harris did. He had to update his website to say, you know, I, I apologize. It turns out Christopher Hitchens is imitable. And good job, Andrew, for uh, figuring that out. But again, he had to be called out on it because you think that would have been, been something Hitchens would have said. You didn't think it needed to be fact-checked, so you just went ahead and spread it. Um, this happens with everybody. It happens all the time. Neil deGrasse Tyson, it happens too. Really recently, uh, there was a kind of right-wing website that said, this guy's been saying things in his talks, because like a lot of people, he gives similar talks at different venues. They said, we've seen this. He explains that this headline is true, but he doesn't cite it. And we've never seen an example of that headline being true. And here's probably the most pernicious example they mentioned. Um, the story that Neil deGrasse Tyson is telling at one point is that George W. Bush, uh, right after 9-11, wanted to separate us from the Muslim terrorists. And that's what uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson is referencing. And he says this in his talk. Here's what happens. George Bush, within a week of the 9-11 terrorist attacks, gave us a speech attempting to distinguish we from they. And who are they? They're, they were sort of Muslim fundamentalists. And he wants to distinguish we from they. And how does he do it? He says, our God is the God who named the stars. That's our God, not their God. That's the way the story comes across. But here's the problem with that. And this is what this right-wing website pointed out. You would think anything George W. Bush says right after 9-11, we're going to know about it. They searched. They were like, we cannot find any evidence of him saying that phrase in the few weeks following 9-11. So Neil deGrasse Tyson, we're just asking you, where are you getting this information from? Like, just give us a citation or something. Because the point he's trying to make is, we are different from them, and here's my evidence. Actually, what happened is George W. Bush did say something like this, but it wasn't to separate us from them. He actually said it after uh, the space shuttle exploded, you know, several years into his presidency, and he was trying to explain how we were all in this together. So he actually, I mean, you could be mad that he used the God phrase, but like he used it to say we're all in this together. Yes, people died, and that's awful, but we're all, we should all weep for them, you know? For whom the bell tolls, that sort of thing. No man is an island. So Neil deGrasse Tyson was wrong. But here's what bothered me. He didn't explain that. It took him a long time to admit that he had made any sort of mistake, that he was doing something wrong by passing along these supposed truths without any citations. And finally, he squeezed in an apology in a longer post about how he gives a lot of talks, and it it's, can be draining at times. So this happens a lot. Let me give you a few more examples in like the atheist world where I see this happening. Um, there's a group called the Backyard Skeptics. They're awesome. They're in California. They're this activist kind of atheist group out there. They paid for a billboard a few years ago. This is what it said. I do not find in Christianity one redeeming feature. It is founded on fables and mythology. Thomas Jefferson. Like, holy crap, that's a damning quotation from the founding, one of the founding fathers, right? So they put that up. They paid for the billboard to go up. And after it was already up somewhere, uh, the media, local media, was like, 
did he actually say that? Because that would be embarrassing, wouldn't it? If, if Thomas Jefferson never said that. Turns out Jefferson never said that. And in fact, if you go to Monticello.org, like the website that's his historical site, they actually mention this quotation very specifically because it's one that's often uh, cited. To, uh, it's given to Jefferson. And they say this. We are asked about this one on a regular basis. Many sites do not cite a source, but a good number of those that do attribute this quote to a letter from Jefferson to a Dr. Wood. As far as we know, Jefferson never wrote to anybody calling himself Dr. Wood. As far as Jefferson's own people know, he never said this. You're just giving people ammo to say, oh, those atheists, they'll spin anything to go in their favor. That's embarrassing. And you know what? I'm mad that like media called them out on it and not us, per se. Um, here's another one. Raise your hand if you have heard this before. George H.W. Bush once said about atheists, no, I don't know that atheists should be considered citizens, nor should they be considered patriots. If you have heard that, raise your hand. A lot of people. Because that one got spread quickly. But here's the thing. If George H.W. Bush actually said that, again, anytime a president or a presidential candidate says that, everything's recorded. We should have that recording somewhere. Where does this quotation come from? Here's the story of where this quotation comes from. There is one guy who happens to be an atheist activist who was a reporter at the time, and he said, I caught George H.W. Bush in the airport once. I asked him this question, and this is what he told me. There's no recording of it. There are no other witnesses to it. And there you go. Spread, internet spread. <laughs> but So here's the thing, I'm not saying the president didn't say that. But we of all people should be more demanding of evidence that he actually did. And if a Christian said something like, oh yeah, I totally heard Obama not Christians, here's what he said, wouldn't we be like, yeah, prove it. How come we don't always do that when it comes to our thing? So this, this quotation, I hate it when it's spread because no one can ever seem to cite a source for it. Here's a good one. There's a website, this was up a few years ago, it's called Eternal Earthbound Pets, and it's the most brilliant idea you've ever heard of. For a fee, this company will take care of your pets after the rapture. <laughs> oh yeah, you're all mad because you didn't think of it. <laughs> as soon as this site was up in 2011, it was one of those viral sensations, like who the heck is gonna fall for this? NPR did a story, and you can see it at the bottom, it said, right now, Eternal Earthbound Pets has contracts with 259 clients. That's roughly $35,000 in contracts. Oh my God, why didn't any of you think of this? <laughs> why didn't I think of this? Um, here's the problem with that. No one, no one asked the guy who runs the site to put them in touch with one of his clients. No one asked him for proof that anyone was actually buying this stuff. And it wasn't until months later that he's like, hey, you guys, I was just kidding. No one has actually paid me any money for this. <laughs> Two people, he said, asked me like, for information. And then he's like, I can't do this to them. So, like, no, he made no money off of this, but he did get publicity for his book, which is great. Um, but, N but here's the thing, NPR had to run a correction later. <laughs> like, and it says, Bart, the man who claimed he would arrange to have your dog walked if you were taken up in the rapture, now says it was a hoax. I spoke to a reporter who wrote about this story. She got in trouble with her bosses for reporting on this story because it turned out to not be true. And here's the thing, it, it very easily could have been verified or dispelled if someone just asked this guy for evidence. And the guy said, no one asked me. They just assumed it was true. What does that say about us? Here's another one. Raise your hand if you've heard a variation of this. If all the atheists and agnostics left America, we'd lose 93% of the National Academy of Sciences and less than 1% of the prison population. Ricky Gervais didn't originate this quotation, but he just advanced it. We've, a lot of us have heard some variation of that quotation. So let's dig into these numbers. Where are these numbers coming from? So let's talk about the 93% of the National Academy of Sciences. It turns out this is actually a study published in the journal Nature. But 
Here's the way the, the researchers did it. Long story short, there were about 500 people they contacted from the National Academy of Sciences in certain fields, and they basically sent them all a survey, which included the question, do you believe in God? Only about 50% of those people wrote back to them. And you know if you're an atheist, you're like, no, I don't, here you go. But no one ever like returns a Cosmo survey saying, no, I never have sex. <laughs> So it turns out not only did only 50% of people respond to them, my guess is that a lot of those other 50% weren't about to admit that they're super religious, but that's the number they used. They actually said in the, in the report, you know, 50% of NAS members at the very bottom returned our survey. So again, I'm not saying that a lot of scientists are not religious or anything like that, but 7% may be lowballing it, even in that subset of scientists. Uh, the Pew Forum, like another uh, research organization, did do a similar survey. They didn't narrow it down as much as the guys from Nature did, but they asked scientists versus the general public, how many of you believe in God? And actually, the general public at the top here, they said 83% of the general public believes in God. When it comes to scientists, I mean all sorts of scientists, the number's at 33%. I'm saying even if you looked at the National Academy of Sciences and that smaller subset, you'd get something between seven and 33. It's probably not as low as we want it to be though. Just saying. Here's the other one, that 1% 1 of atheists are in prison, less than 1%. Where does that come from? I looked for that information. Last summer, I was trying to figure out the source of where that 1% number came from, and there were hundreds, uh, hundreds, there were thousands of web pages that use that information. And when you try to figure out where are they getting it from, what's the original citation for this information, it all goes back to one website, adherence.com slash a whole bunch of stuff, which makes you feel better. <laughs> and it all goes, this is, this is literally a screenshot from that site. It's all typed out by hand, like all this stuff. And the story is this, a guy named Rod Swift emailed or sent a letter to the Federal Bureau of Prisons asking how many atheists are in prison, basically. And he heard back from someone named Denise golem -Basky, And she said, here is the breakdown of people in the federal prison system. And if you scroll down, you can see that red box there. It says atheist, it's 0.2%. And that's it, that's where the number comes from. We are 0.2% of the prison population. So here's the question, who is Rod? Who's Denise? Does she actually work at the Federal Bureau of Prisons? Because I could not find any record that she did. I did find a Denise Golombaski who worked at another law firm, and I called her up and I left a message saying, here's who I am and here's what I'm trying to do. She didn't return my call because I think I was creepy. Um, <laughs> but I couldn't find evidence that she actually worked there. And I don't know if this guy mistyped some numbers or anything like that. Who knows? It was, it was literally someone typed this out by hand. It wasn't a screenshot of something. So I don't know whether to trust it. And every other website all cited this one website. So it all goes down to this. Is this true or not? And how do we know? And how do you figure that out? Because uh, Rod Swift isn't exactly a Googleable name, you know? So then I was like, uh, maybe I can ask the Federal Bureau of Prisons. So I sent them an email. I would like to know the religious makeup of all your prisoners. Signed, random dude on the internet. <laughs> and they wrote back to me. <laughs> and they're like, all right, here you go. <laughs> so they sent me an actual breakdown and it turns out, when it comes down, they actually do have atheists on the list. But while we're at it, they also have no preference, other, unknown. I mean, and these are all categories that people who don't believe in God may choose to be in. And this is, again, a voluntary thing. Not everyone had to answer this question, per se. Um, so when you look at these numbers and you do the math, the same way Mr. Swift did it, like, more than almost 20 years ago or something, guess what the number is? It's not 0.2% of the prison population. It's 0.07. It's even lower than we thought it was. But that's with all the caveats of, you know, this is, this is not necessarily a scientific survey. It's self-reported. It comes with all those caveats and stuff. And by the way, where do we ever hear these numbers even cited? 
the place we hear these numbers cited is when people are making the case that atheists are more moral than the general public, which makes this assumption that if you're not in prison, you're all great, and if you are in prison, there's something wrong with you, and there's a problem with that assumption as well. Let's get that out there. But if you do the math the same way, it's actually lower than we thought it was. But it's still not a number we should be throwing out as support of how awesome we are, you know? All right, now let's talk about Christians because that's way more interesting to me. Um, it's a lot easier to talk about what other people are doing wrong, right? I read this on a Christian website. It was a guy who was an ex-Christian, and he said, I used to go to a school called Pensacola Christian College. It's one of those really hardcore religious schools. You have to sign a faith statement. You have, to, you have to be pretty hardcore Christian to go there. And he said that there was this crazy rule that they had at the school that if there was a fire alarm, all the women had to be in proper attire before they left their rooms. So if you were in pajama pants, you better change in the case of a fire. You better put on a skirt before you go outside. And if you should perish, then at least you'll know you died for the cause of not tempting the firefighters to lust after you. Oh my God, I can't believe any school would do that. Like, I went, to, I went to state school, and at our school, if you were in the shower, you better hope you have a towel because you are running out of there in the case of a fire. And I get the whole modesty thing, but I'm like, really? In the case of a fire, you're going to make them change out of their pajamas? Just get them out of the building. So again, this was one guy's thing. I could not find the safety procedures on Pensacola's website, so I tried to email them. And I'm like, listen, what's your uh, fire policy? What's the dress code policy that you have? Trying to say, like, I heard this thing that women have to, like, change their clothes before a fire. Is that true? I'm helping. Do you understand I'm trying to help them out here? I got an email back from them. Hammond, sorry for the delay. Thanks for your patience. Yes, we asked the girls if they can grab knee-length shorts or a skirt to quickly change into. Once students exit the building, they have to stand far away from the building. I hope that helps. Let me know if you have any questions. I'm like, seriously, you just admitted that? I can't believe you admitted <laughs> Let me try again. I emailed her back. I'm like, just, just, I want to make sure I have this straight. In the case of a fire, <laughs> you're tr seriously saying they have to change clothing? I mean, this is an emergency situation, not just a drill, right? Like, what are you going to have them do? This sounds kind of unsafe. Hint, hint, right? <laughs> so she wrote back. Yeah, the priority would be to get out of the building quickly. The closets are right by the door on their way out of the room. <laughs> so it'd be possible to be mod. A robe would be fine. Thank you. <laughs> so that's a real rule <laughs> that exists. I tried helping them out. I, it didn't work. <laughs> How many of you know who uh, this guy is? Yeah, okay, you know him. <laughs> that's David Barton. He is a guy who twists history to suit Christian revisionism type stuff. He was talking, he gives these talks about, you know, how our world, our nation is really a Christian nation. And he told this story about how those nasty atheists got God out of the public schools, which is not true, but okay. The story he said was that 50 years ago when they said you could not have the mandatory Bible readings in public school, he said that there was a psychologist the Supreme Court cited in their report, in their, in their decision, and they said this psychologist said that reading the Bible in school would cause, like, a mental breakdown. It would be mental child abuse if we were to read the Bible. Can you believe the secular Supreme Court said that, my Christian audience? That's the way he was saying this to his people. That's not true. Here's what actually happened. The Supreme Court, in their ruling, they have to explain the story of how the case even got to them in the first place. They have to say the history of the case. And in one of the lowest courts to hear this case, there was a psychologist who presented. And what he said is, the plaintiff was a guy named Ellery Shemp. He was a student at the time. He was, I think, in his he was high school, early teens. Ellery was raised in a Jewish family. And he said, you know, if young Jewish kids are taught like the New Testament information, and they're told that everything they're believing in is wrong, and their parents are wrong, and they're going to hell, that could be pretty traumatic for a lot of these children. And that was one of the things he said. And the Supreme Court only said, here's what happened in the lower court, and here's what happened after that, and here's our decision where we're, we're not even weighing all of that into account, but here's what we have to say, 
and that's why you shouldn't have mandatory Bible reading. So to be clear, no one said reading the Bible was going to like cause some abuse or anything. And second, they weren't actually citing the psychologist as evidence of why we needed to remove all of this from school. But of course, no one said this to David Barton, and even if they tried, it wasn't going to get through to him because he makes a living pretending that's not true. So I was going to write about this on my website, but then I'm like, that's not enough because I can always say he's wrong, but saying David Barton's wrong is like saying water is wet. So I emailed Ellery Shemp, and I'm like, hey, Ellery, uh, this guy says this about your Supreme Court case. Do you have a response to that? And Ellery gave me the greatest soundbite, which said, uh, Barton rakes in millions, has the moral compass of a cockroach, and wants us to believe he has God's direct email address. I never thought the Genesis story made any sense, and I didn't believe in talking snakes, but then Glenn Beck and David Barton came along. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Since, like, half of you in this audience are bloggers, I should point out that this story got picked up by a lot of places, and it's not because of the David Barton stuff, it's because Ellery Shemp was willing to offer a soundbite, uh, which was so easy to get because he's such a nice guy. Um, I wrote this book a couple years ago. It's called A Young Atheist Survival Guide. I've written a lot about young atheists and some of the stories they have to go through, some of the struggles they have to deal with. And one of the cool parts about writing the book is I got to follow up on a lot of the stories I'd reported on or written about in the past few years. And one of them was this story that appeared in the New York Times a few years ago. And here's the story. There is a high school atheist group in Florida. That is it. That is the story. They exist. That was the entire purpose of the story. Like, can you believe there are atheists in high school? And they meet, and they discuss this stuff. And it was this heartbreaking story, if you read this, because they were saying, like, these kids just want to get together to discuss religion. And look at, the, uh, look at these sound bites that they included in the story, because this is what went out on the New York Times. One of the students, there are students who don't want to tell their parents. They don't want their parents to know they belong to an atheist club. I tell my mother I'm at Ocean Club. Like, that's not even a thing. <laughs> but this is the lie that someone has to come up with because questioning their faith would be such a horrible thing. Another student said this. Um, she asked that her name not be used for fear it would hurt her father. I don't want us to grow apart over this. Like, how could anyone, even a religious person, read that and think, yeah, that's the reaction we want them to have? And so after all this, I... I contact when I was writing the book I contacted the, the teacher who was the faculty sponsor of this organization and I'm like how did you get a group like this going because I know when I started a group in college we were lucky to get like seven people to show up maybe right and he has 40 kids showing up every week and he said a quarter of them are religious they just come to the meetings because they like to be challenged which is awesome they had such camaraderie there and I'm like how did you do that how did they even know to come to you to ask you to be their faculty sponsor. And he said this, he, he's like, you know, I've taught at the school for like 30 years. You know, he has tenure, he's not worried about anything like that. But he said, I, I am an atheist, but I never talked about it, as you shouldn't, really, in the classroom. But really, when student, he taught a philosophy class, like an international baccalaureate class. And he said, we talk about religion in the classroom. And students will always ask me, Mr. Creamer, what do you believe in? And he would always give them this PC answer saying, doesn't matter what I believe in. It's all about what you guys believe. You know, what do you think about this? Does anyone have a rebuttal to that? Let's, let's have a civil discussion about that. That's the answer he would always give. But then a few years back, he realized no other teacher in the school does that. When all the kids ask those other teachers, you know, what do you believe in? They're like, oh, I'm a Christian and I go to this church. You should come to my church. It's a great church. It's like no one else hides who they are. <laughs> when the kids ask him about it. And there's a big difference between doing that and like preaching this stuff. But like, you shouldn't be ashamed of like not even saying that stuff, right? So finally he told himself, I'm not gonna hide it anymore. If a kid asks me what I believe in, I will be honest. So a few years back, he was teaching this philosophy class. They were talking about religion. And the student asked, you know, Mr. Creamer, what do you believe? And he's like, I don't believe in God. I don't go to church and my wife doesn't go to church. You know, we're, we're both atheists. And he like braced himself because this is Florida and you don't know what's coming. And the kid's reaction was like, oh, eh. <laughs> they totally didn't care at all. It, this was a non-issue for them. 
And he had been fearing this for such a long time. And in fact, like not too long after that, some kids came up to him and said, we're atheists too and we want to start a group. Would you be willing to be a faculty sponsor? And that's how this whole thing came about. Like how cool is that? And the New York Times didn't touch any of that. Like that's the story I wanted to hear. A couple last uh, examples really quick. Um, I like this whole idea of trying to see these things firsthand, trying to get the information instead of hearing about it from somewhere else. Um, I live in the western suburbs of Chicago, and also based out of there is a group called Americans for Truth About Homosexuality, which is a group that spreads lies about homosexuality. <laughs> and it turned out a few years ago, they were hosting a conference, not far from me, where they wanted to train young activists to fight the homosexual agenda. They were having a, a three-day conference to spread this stuff, and they were gonna bring in all those hateful bigots to speak to all these kids. And they said, if you wanna sign up, here's the way you sign up for it. And I'm like, well, they're gonna recognize a brown dude in the audience if I go, so I can't sign up for this. <laughs> but I really wanna know what they're gonna say inside there. So I basically put out a call. Does anyone want to attend this thing? I will cover your registration. I'll do whatever you need, just let me know. And it ended up, a guy and a girl said, we'll go. So we registered them, they went to this thing. And here's what I heard, we got together like the first night of the conference, we got together and I'm like, are you guys okay? Like, did they do anything? They're like, no, we're fine. Um, here's the story though. Here's what the, the girl Maria told me. She said, there weren't a lot of kids there there weren't a lot, there were all adults and like a handful of children, or like high schoolers, college kids, only a handful. They couldn't get people to sign up for this thing. But the entire conference was geared toward that audience. And all these people who support the idea that they were spreading, they were just kind of around the back, you know, kind of supporting all this. And there were these people talking, and you have an idea of what they said, they were spreading these horrible things. But there was one girl in the audience who would raise her hand and she would ask questions of these people like, I have a friend at school who is a lesbian. I am not sure what to say to her. I feel bad for her. I want to fix her. You know, what do I say to her? And the speakers would offer their recommendations to her and stuff. And but for all things considered, this girl was actually very nice. She was very polite. Maria talked to her during the breaks. They got along really well. And you're like, you know, it's, there's a big difference between someone who believes that when they're young and really sincerely wants to help and these adults who should really know better. And so, but, so Maria's like, she was very, really nice. And at the end of the day, that girl came up to Maria and said, hey, I just wanted to let you know, it was really nice talking to you. I gotta tell you something though. I'm not gonna be here the next two days. I'm actually undercover for a website. <laughs> yeah. To which Maria says, no way. <laughs> I am here undercover for a website. And by the way, so is that guy sitting over there. <laughs> to which the first girl says, no way, because so is that guy over there. <laughs> I'm pretty sure there were more undercover people there than there were kids. <laughs> and they didn't catch them, ever. So I published like three days worth of posts, it was great. Um, someone sent me this Onion article later on, Klan rally, 70% undercover reporters. <laughs> Here is the moral of all of this. <laughs> Especially because there are so many people here who use social media, who have YouTube channels and blogs and Twitter and all that. It is so easy to retweet something someone says. It's so easy to say, oh hey, look, someone else reported on this. It suits my agenda, so I'm gonna pass it along. I know it happens in the blogging community. And so all I'm saying is usually, I have found it is not hard to double check if this stuff is true. I really have to do a minimal amount of work to see if this stuff is actually legit. Do you know how many times I've gotten a story over the past year that said, hey, I heard the story about how a pastor was trying to do a baptism, or a pastor was trying to walk on water and he drowned. I've gotten that story many times over the past several years. And every time the source is a dubious one. 
and I can't tell, you know what I mean? Like, it's not hard to fact check this stuff. More importantly, if it's something that someone says within the atheist community, it's very easy to get in touch with all these people because they're so accessible and they're willing to talk to you too. All I'm saying is before you do any of this stuff, fact check it, if you can. You don't have to be a journalist. You don't have to be a pseudo journalist like me. You can easily fact check a lot of this stuff, especially before you put it on Facebook or Twitter. Just see like, I wonder what the source is. Is this actually true? Am I, am I linking to a satire site? Um, or if they quote someone as saying something nasty, even if they are religious or someone you really want to dislike, do they actually say it? Because you better be right about it. Um, and then the next thing, and this is for anyone who is interested in that journalism aspect, it's not hard to follow up on these stories. Because what I have found writing about this stuff for several years is that, yeah, the original story is interesting, but usually what no one ever does is make a note to themselves saying, I wonder what's going on with this story six months later when it's out of everyone's mind. And usually that story is way more interesting than anything else. And it's also something no one else is covering. Um, so something I try to do a lot is just, set, if I'm criticizing an agency, if I'm criticizing a person, I make sure I send them an email saying, this is what I've heard that you said. If it's wrong, please let me know. Um, I get this from a place all the time. I, a parents will email me, like my child's school was passing out this Christian propaganda and stuff. Um, I'm, I'm like ready to file a lawsuit. And it's like, send them an email first and just double check that there was no miscommunication here, that this was actually going on. I can tell you like the Freedom From Religion Foundation, Americans United for Separation of Church and State, none of them file lawsuits immediately. They all send a letter first to the districts or whatever government agency saying, this is what we heard you are doing. This is the evidence we're giving you for it. Is this actually happening? If it is, stop and we will go away. If, it's not, if it is true, we may have to take action. That's what all of their letters say all the time. And why can't we do something similar? Um, this is my contact information. It's the same information you will find anywhere online for me. If you have any other questions, um, send me on Twitter, send me an email, or just find me somewhere around here. I'll be around. But thank you so much. And by the way, people watching on the live stream, donate to Skepticon. That's yeah, a good cause. Thank you all. Yes. Do I find Snopes to be a credible source for fact checking? Almost always, yes. And you know why? It's because they not only tell you, here's the viral story that's going around, here's what we know about the origins of it, and here's where you could check it out for yourself to see where the origin is from. Like, they, they cite where they're saying this stuff from. It's not just a voice from above saying, this story's a hoax, see you all later. Like, they, liter they say, this is where we're getting the information from. Snopes is awesome, absolutely. I, I will tell you, I, my mom would send me these four words that she gets from her friends, right? And I would just respond back with a link to Snopes. And I've, I did it so many times that she stopped sending them to me. I want to believe it's because she started doing that herself as opposed to, I guess I just won't send it to my son this time. <laughs> What other questions? Can't see. Yes. I'm sorry. Could you repeat that question? Yeah, how do you get people to think before they post when they're the people spreading this misinformation all the time? Um, I think the most effective way is just to, and this is in general, how do you effectively communicate to somebody that you disagree with them or that they're wrong about something? And it's not with, you're an idiot. It's not with a sarcastic, like, of course you would post this. It's just saying, I think you're wrong about this because here's where it's coming from. And they actually say at the bottom, like, this is a satire website. So I'm pretty sure you're off on that. I mean, there's, a, there's an art to communicating it that way. I'm not saying it's always gonna work, but that's probably your best bet. Yes? What's, what are my thoughts on Wikipedia as a source? So Wikipedia, because in theory, anyone could edit it, it's not necessarily credible, 
But here's the thing, Wikipedia, like anything else, if it's a good Wikipedia article, they always have their footnotes. They always say, this is in here, but here's where we're getting that information from. So, I mean, I know English teachers say this to students all the time. I don't care if you use Wikipedia, but you can't say Wikipedia is your source. You better have the other sources. And if it's a good Wikipedia article, they will say, this is where we're getting this information from. On a lot of really good articles, I mean, that, that section of footnotes is pretty long. So I use Wikipedia a lot, but it's not that I see it on Wikipedia and I'm like, must be true. It's that I, if I want to cite something, I'm going to double check it. And by the way, I will tell you, there was a story not long ago. Um, I think uh, PZ mentioned him yesterday. Victor Stenger passed away not too long ago. I heard about that story one day, and the link that everyone gave was Wikipedia. And it had a death date on it, but no citation, and there was no news article about it anywhere. And all the people, and I, it was being posted by credible people, and I just sent them like, hey, where are you getting this information from? Because I can't find it anywhere. And I couldn't get a good answer. And no one was even saying like, I got a private email. No one said that. And you know, I was trying to figure out, what, how do I figure this out? Because I don't know the guy. I don't have an in with him. But I did find an email for him online. So I found like Victor Stenger at whatever it was. And I'm like, I, I hope you don't, I hope you get this. <laughs> but um, if anyone's looking at this, can you confirm this for me? I'm sorry. Like it was the most awkward email. Um, and to her great generosity, his wife responded back. She's like, yeah, uh, it's unfortunately true. He did pass away. Um, and uh, I appreciate the nice message and like, you know, apologize and all that. Um, she was very polite and respectful. But finally, I actually had someone who explained to me what happened and I could pass along that information as a credible source. Um, but it was, people were using Wikipedia as their source, which is like, if this is not true, if this is not funny at all. <laughs> like, so. Uh, yes, over there. Where is the meme coming from that all classrooms should spread the Ameri or should have the American flag up there? <laughs> Which is weird because every classroom I've ever been in has an American flag. Um, I don't know where that one is coming. I haven't seen that meme. I don't know where it's coming from. But a lot of times you will see if, um, for example, it happens with Ten Commandments monuments all the time, too, or plaques in a classroom, where anytime someone says, you know, you can't have this in the classroom, um, eventually it gets taken down. In the case of a flag, I haven't heard that story. I can, let me make up a plausible reason here. Maybe someone somewhere said, this flag needs to come down. It wouldn't actually happen. Like, the school's not going to say, we're taking down the flag. But if someone publicized that story that this one person wanted to take it down, even though it's not going to happen, the story gets spread that, oh, this is what those people are trying to do. I've seen that version of a story a lot of times. Not that specific one, but that sort of thing happens. It happens like one place, and then people just assume this is part of some big thing and not just one person somewhere. That happens. Yes? Uh, everyone knows the onion is satire. Right, everyone knows the onion is satire, hopefully. Ha! Ah, ah, you wish they did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, how do we let people know which websites are satire? And Facebook was going to do a thing where they were going to say, this is satire, like when people posted those links, which people got mad about because you're ruining the whole point of the story. Um, you know what? I, d I don't know that that's something that needs to be fixed. I think there's value in saying like, I know this is fake. Usually those sites have a disclaimer on them somewhere so they don't get in trouble for what they post. And that, that is always there. And it's funny because I've had one of those sites that was like a pseudo-Christian site that said a lot of nasty things about atheists. They said some hilariously mean things about me. And people would be like, I saw this online. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm like, it's, fi it's funny. I laughed. Like, but I don't think you, I think the only thing to do is like, if someone does that, do what I said before. Like, this, I don't think this is an actual 
real website. Here's how I know that, and here's, you could send them other headlines they've posted, you could send them the fine print. Um, but you know what? Some people just want to believe the headlines, they want to believe the story. That's why The Onion is so powerful, because it tricks people all the time. And it's like, you would think they would know better by now, but yeah, no one ever knows better. <laughs> you would hope. Yes? Yeah, there's no link between autisms and va uh, vaccines and autism. Why do you think people still believe that if you have just a huge amount of evidence saying that it's possible? Why do people believe that like vaccines cause autism? Why do they listen to Jenny McCarthy, which is the general <laughs> question? I think part of it is you want uh, just an emotional one. You want an explanation for why your child is acting a certain way that you think is abnormal or something. You want to try to find an answer for that. And here is an explanation that seems, in their minds, plausible. Science is, it's really hard to say, here's a research paper, here's what a scientist has to say that says you're wrong about your emotions. That's a hard thing to do, ever. I mean, we could all say, like, it's hard to convince religious people to stop believing in God. Why? We all have arguments for why that's true. Doesn't mean it's going to change all these minds because you're trying to tell people everything you've thought about and believed, I'm trying to tell you you're wrong about how you think. That's, it's just not an easy thing to do. Um, so that's the hard sell, because you have a mother who has a child and she's saying, this is, I'm pretty, like, what caused it? And then you have other parents who are like, well, yes, this happened to me too after I vaccinated my child. And it seems to make sense. And they finally have an explanation because they don't have that otherwise. It's a compelling story. It happens to not be like proven. There is the evidence isn't there for it, but it is a compelling story. So I can un I can understand why people fall for it. But I think that's the tough thing that we as skeptics have to deal with, which is you're trying to convince people that their cherished beliefs, their sacred cows, are not true. That's hard to do for anybody. I mean, it works. I'm sure all of you are evidence that you can be your mind can be changed, but it's hard. They want control instead of randomness. Yeah, they, they want an explanation that feels like they could have done something about this or whatever. Yes? Yeah. Um, so the question is, why do Christians lie about things blatantly, for example, evolution, things like that? Because they sincerely believe their lies. That's it. They, they really do think evolution is not credible. Uh, they really do think that Genesis can answer a lot of things, you know what I mean? And again, this is the hard challenge for us, which is they've been taught this, they've been raised with this, it makes sense in their minds. And if you live in this bubble where all these outside sources are trying to challenge these cherished beliefs you hold, you cling to them even harder. It's really hard when people, this is why, again, there's an art to telling people how they are wrong. Most people I've ever seen do it really horribly. And so the question is like, how do you convince someone that, you know, evolution is pretty damn credible? Um, you could throw all the information, all the evidence you want at them. Ken Ham isn't gonna change his mind. He has too much staked in it, not just as a business, but his whole way of thinking is structured on this idea that, you know, Genesis has, the answers are in Genesis. And a lot of Christians, like, if you take that away, all those other dominoes are going to topple. They cannot have that happen. Otherwise, it'll just mess with them really badly. But again, um, I used to be religious. I'm sure a lot of you were. When you finally let that happen, and you are like, you follow the evidence where it goes, you really do form this new, new worldview that does make sense again. And this time it does fit with reality. But it's hard to convince people to allow that to happen. Um, so I don't think they are lying. Perp and I think there is a difference between I know this is wrong, but I'm going to lie to you anyway, which is what I think that commandment would tell them not to do, versus I believe this thing. You're telling me it's wrong, but I don't, I don't think you're right. I really do believe this. So when I push for creationism, 
it's not because I know evolution is true. It's because I sincerely believe that, uh, which is a problem when it comes to, you know, Hobby Lobby and things like that and what you think about birth control. Because they don't care. I mean, the court even said this. We don't care what's true. The question is, do you actually believe this? And if you really do believe this, we have to rule based on that. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> so the the <laughs> so the comment is Christians are lazy that they want to believe what their pastor tells them it saves them the work of doing the research. I, I think there is actually some grain of truth to that. I think there is a point to that, that it's very easy to believe it when it comes from a source that you trust. I think the point I want to get across with this talk anyway, we often make the same mistake, and we got to make sure we are not doing that, and maybe they will start to follow eventually, but that's the hard thing to do, to say that this person, I mean, how hard is it? The person you are trusting is not telling you things that are true. They may believe it, but it's not true. Trying to convince someone of that is so hard to do. And that is a challenge we all have to deal with. How do you convince someone that their firmly held beliefs are true? So again, I don't think it's necessarily laziness, and this is where I would challenge you. I don't think it's necessarily laziness. I think it's because they really do believe this, so they have no reason to question it because it's coming from a trusted source. Of course, we're saying like, no, it's wrong. You gotta look at this stuff for yourself. But if you're not given any reason to think that it's not true, they're not going to start looking for any reason to doubt it. I wish that was wrong, but I, I think that is what's going on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot of people are educated within the church. Yeah. You should ask them that. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Give it up for him. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, I will unplug this. <laughs>